Well, welcome everyone to Southridge Community Church. My name is Gabrielle. Happy Sunday, happy Mother's Day. Please come stand and uh, worship with us this morning. Say I am. 
Jesus, we belong to you, Lord. Thank you, Father, for caring for us, Lord. May this morning just be one of worship, praise, celebration, God. We praise your name this morning. We thank you, Lord, for your goodness, and we remember, Lord, your goodness. We forget not all your benefits, Lord. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Well, good morning, everyone. Happy Sunday and happy Mother's Day to all of our mothers, whether you're a biological mother, adopted mother, a foster mother, or even just a spiritual mother. We want to celebrate and honor you today. So welcome uh, this morning. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Olivia Ciada. I am on staff here at Southridge, and I'm so glad that you joined us for service today. This is your first time with us, and a special welcome to you. So if you are joining us online, you can click that new here button to get connected with us. And if you are here in the auditorium, we invite you to make your way back to the Welcome Center following the service. Our team would love to greet you back there. A few opportunities to mention for you this morning. First is an opportunity for our men. Um, our spring men's gathering, guys, is coming up this Saturday, May the 20th at 9 o'clock. And it's going to be a really meaningful, uh, awesome gathering for fellowship. You're going to have breakfast and worship. You'll be led in worship by a guest, uh, Arun Paul. And you will be uh, taking in a video teaching by Daniel Ritchie, who was actually born without arms. And while a lot of us don't have such a visible struggle such as him, he uh, struggles with uh, issues of identity and uh, measuring up and finding your worth and comparing with other people. And that's a struggle I think that's universal universal for all of us um, and for, for men specifically as you guys are leaders and providers of your families. So you are not going to want to miss this really impactful, fun, engaging morning. Uh, registration is open online and on the Church Center app this morning, so make sure you make plans uh, to come out on Saturday morning for our men's gathering. We also want to highlight our interest groups this morning. Interest groups are SR groups that are formed around common passions and interests. Anything from volleyball to walking to fiction writing. We started an indoor soccer and a basketball group uh, earlier this year. And our softball uh, team is getting ready to engage in their season over the next couple of weeks. So if any of those uh, sound interesting to you, we would encourage you to check out all of our offerings that we have this season for interest groups. You can do that on the current opportunities page, either on the website or on the app. Next, we also want to highlight our baptism service coming up in just a couple of weeks on June the 4th. It'll just be one service that day at 10 o'clock, so we won't have SR kids or students or groups that day because we want to invite our entire church family to come in and celebrate with those in our body that are taking this step of proclaiming their faith through baptism. Really, that's always such an exciting service, um, and the energy in here is always amazing. So we encourage you to make plans to attend. Additionally, following that service, we will be serving lunch, uh, and there's no cost or registration for that, so just make plans to join us. Uh, we'll be talking about that in the coming weeks as well, but mark your calendars for Sunday, June 4th at 10 o'clock. And we also want to just thank you so much for your faithful giving. It enables us to experience belonging, embrace God's grace, and extend God's love as a church body together. If you don't already give and you would like to, there's lots of ways you can. We've got boxes mounted on the back wall of the auditorium. You can also give online or through the Church Center app. At this time, I'm going to invite our team to come back up and continue to lead us in worship. As they do, I just want to share a little bit of a reflection in honor of Mother's Day. Uh, for a lot of us in this room who are mothers, I'm a new mom myself, this day is a really exciting and joyous celebratory uh, day. Maybe you woke up to flowers from your husband or cards uh, from your kiddos or you have plans later this morning or later today to be with family, to share a meal, um, to celebrate. For some of us, uh, this day is a hard day and we want to acknowledge that some of you might be grieving a loss some of you might be struggling with desiring something that is not, you're not in the season for yet. Some of you might be feeling angry or hurt because of this day. 
And for some of you, you might want to just forget that Mother's Day is a thing. So to acknowledge kind of all that mixture of emotions that might be running through people's heads this morning, I just wanted to share a brief word um, from one of my favorite passages of scripture, and that's Genesis chapter 16. And it's the first time in scripture that we see a person named God. And you might think, oh, it's got to be someone important like an Abraham or an Isaac or a Jacob. But in fact, the first person in scripture who names God is a woman. She's a mother and she's a slave and she's from a foreign land. Her name is Hagar and she is in a desperate situation in Genesis 16. She is at a low point. And it's at that point that scripture tells us that the angel of the Lord found Hagar. And in response to her encounter with God, she says, I have now seen the one who sees me. And at that time, that was huge because women were ancillary at best, and especially a woman like Hagar, who was a slave and a foreigner. And in today's culture, Sometimes we want to just be seen as women. We strive for importance. We strive to measure up. We're either too much or not enough. We're overwhelmed or underappreciated. But ladies, God sees us. And on this Mother's Day, no matter where you're at in that range of emotions, whether you're feeling celebrated or you're feeling defeated, God sees you whether you're fighting tears of joy right now or tears of pain right now, God sees you. And we just sang, I am who you say I am. So I just wanted to remind you that these are a few things that the God who sees you says that you are. He calls us a friend, chosen and free. We are his workmanship, his child, and his messenger. We are a new creation, an heir, and a sanctified saint. Our bodies are temples, and we are members of Christ's body. We are adopted, redeemed, and forgiven. We are sealed by the Holy Spirit and made alive in Christ. We are citizens of heaven, and we are no longer slaves. You're no longer slaves, my friends. Let's stand and sing that together. You unravel me with a melody. You surround me. Of deliverance from my enemies till all my fears are gone. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. I'm no longer. I've been born again into your family. Your love flows through my veins. And I'm no longer a slave of fear. I am a child of God. I'm no longer. I'm 
thank you for the reality this morning to be able to hear and to sing of the truths, God, that you, you created us and that you know us. Not only do you know us, but you see us. Not only do you, do you see us, you pursue us. You sent your son Jesus to die for us on a cross and to rise again, God, and we claim the promises that we are now children of God. We have all that we need to live for you. God, the issue is not what you've done for us, it's for us making place in our hearts and our souls and our minds and every part to allow more of you to be a part of us. God, we pray for that as individuals. We pray that as families. We pray that as a church. We pray that for this world. We pray that for the church universal in this world. God, we just pray that we will recognize, God, who we are in you. God, help us to be bold, knowing that we're incredibly loved. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. God, you overwhelm us with your love. Thanks for the opportunity this morning. 
to worship you. In your name, amen. Before you sit down, if you feel comfortable, just greet somebody. You can hug them if you want or just say hello or happy Mother's Day. Huh? Hey and hello. <laughs> Good morning. Happy Mother's Day for all the mothers. I am privileged to have an incredible mom. My mom is literally, she's probably about four foot five now. She used to be like four, she used to say she was 4'11", but she's like this, and she's going to be 88 years old, and she's a fire plug, and uh, loves Jesus, and she's a mom to me and my sister and to, to many others. And my wife is an incredible mom. She always tells me I'm not your mother, um, <laughs> but she's an incredible mother. I'm just blessed to have her as my wife. So just, my name is Dan Arthur, and I'm involved here at, on the board at Southridge. And first, I have two things I want to talk about quickly. First is just to thank you for giving. We'll give a little update if we have a little thing on the screen, share. That's where we are year to date. Um, again, we are as a church uh, about experiencing belonging, embracing God's grace, and extending God's love. And so your giving allows us to do that, have ministry here, ministry in the community, and be involved in ministry around the globe. I mean, if anyone was not here last week, we had one of our partners, Sam Fiore, speak. And uh, Sam was unbelievably passionate about what it means to live for Jesus and everything you do, whether you're going to the supermarket or whether you're reading the Bible or whether you're going to work, whatever it is, we are God's witnesses everywhere, whether it's Italy, Clinton, or any, wherever you may be. So thank you for your giving. We really appreciate it. Also, if you look back in the beginning of the Bible, in Genesis, um, God created the heaven and earth in six days. And on the seventh day, it says that he rested. And he started the principle of a Sabbath, like the seventh day is a principle of rest, of spiritual rejuvenation. Um, for God, even instituted that. But also, if you look in the Old Testament and the New Testament, it was instituted for the people of Israel. Um, it's the seventh day, the seventh year. They talked about the land having rest. They talk about during festivals. And if we come into the New Testament, we have the same thing tying over. Obviously, the Sabbath day for us is the first day of the week. But we're, we're challenged also as a congregation that we need to take care of those that that serve us and those that are our pastors and our leaders and our teachers. And uh, there's a principle that comes out of the word Sabbath called sabbatical. You may have heard that terminology before. Sabbatical is really a time, really, it's been used beyond that to every other kind of field, but it really came out of the, the principle of spiritual rejuvenation, to have rest emotionally, physically, mentally, and spiritually. So as a board, we talked about this for the last couple of years as churches all over the globe that provide sabbaticals for their pastoral staff. So we have instituted a policy starting this year that everyone that's a pastoral level, an executive level, uh, will have opportunity to take a sabbatical. And that's based on serving, have served seven years here at Southridge. Um, obviously, we're starting it now. So some people, like obviously Nathan has been here. We celebrated, how many years have we celebrated? 25 years. There we go. He was here 25 years. So obviously, it's more than seven. Um, so we're starting now. Then every seven years after that, everyone that's at pastoral level or executive uh, director level will have a sabbatical. So Nathan is going to be the first one this summer. Most of this summer, Nathan will be away on a sabbatical. Uh, Steve Sheets, who's the vice chairman of myself, got together with Nathan and talked about some of his plans and some of the things that he intends to do. And really, it's, it's, it's revolving around emotional, physical, and spiritual health and rejuvenation, kind of get away from just all the stresses of, there's a lot of stress, we all have stress, but I mean, those that are in this ministry here, there's a lot of stress, uh, we want to allow him to heal and allow him to, to grow and allow him to get to know God on a deeper level, and so we're excited for that, we ask you just to pray for Nathan for this summer as he, as he does that, and we're excited to have Nathan as our pastor, and he'll be back in September, stronger than ever, and uh, we're excited for that. And so, with no further ado, I just want to ask Nathan to come and, and to preach to us. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. And, uh, yeah, just I really do appreciate the efforts of our board um, to make all that happen. And I'm looking forward to that time. Uh, we'll talk about that more as it gets the date approaches. Uh, I'll be here through June 25th, 
And then uh, you're going to be blessed as a congregation. We have our summer series planned. Uh, Pete Gatto is speaking, John Ciotta, Jeremy Moore, Dan Arthur, Rob Chief Okoye will be back. And so uh, you'll have a very rich summer. So I'm excited also. I'm like, man, I like this series that we're planning for this summer. Like, <laughs> kind of bummed. Uh, anyway, yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to that. Let me take a moment uh, also. Uh, one thing as well. Next Sunday, uh, some, probably many of us in this room know Dave and Elaine Nace. Uh, they've been around Southridge for over 50 years. Uh, they're going to be moving uh, near their daughter in Virginia in June. And so next Sunday, we're going to have a little, um, just a farewell for them, uh, to send them off and to express our appreciation as a body for the way they have served this body. So you can look forward to that next Wednesday have an opportunity to write notes of appreciation to them, and uh, next Sunday we'll be celebrating that. Let me take a moment and pray, and then we'll jump in. God, thank you for this time. Thank you for the work of your spirit. Thank you for the songs that we could sing, the reflection, the groundedness in your truth, God. We thank you for that, Lord. Bless our time as we look into your word. Strengthen our beings in your truth. We ask that in your name. Amen. In October of 2021, Christianity Today had an article. Christianity Today is a pretty prominent Christian magazine that deals with a number of issues related to that whole circle of interaction. Uh, They had an article entitled this, Empty Pews are an American Public Health Crisis. The subtitle was, Americans are rapidly giving up on church. Our minds and bodies will pay the price. The article described the results and consequences of a 2019 Gallup report. Gallup does many, many surveys. In 2019, Gallup reported that only 36% of Americans view organized religion with a great deal of confidence. That's down from 68% in 1975, which is almost a 12 uh, percentage point drop. The decline in confidence in churches has been accompanied by steep recent declines in both church membership and attendance. Barna Group found that 10 years ago, in 2011, this was when the article was written in 2021, 43% of Americans said they went to church every week. By February of 2020, that number had dropped to 14 percentage points, had dropped 14 percentage points to 29 percent. In many ways, the common perception was that that was the result of some challenging issues with churches, um, challenging issues with the public behavior of pastors. Sometimes religious institutions would not handle things well. And so in some ways, it was ascribed to some of those factors. That being said, however, it became more apparent that mostly people were not attending when they were asked, not for those reasons, but simply because they were choosing to do religion by themselves. People who think of themselves as Christians are more likely to say that they practice their faith in other ways. So 44% say they practice their faith in other ways rather than gathering together in some kind of church setting environment. Others feel that there's something that they don't like about the service. That was 38%. You would think, perhaps, that that kind of response and that kind of interaction would actually indicate that maybe people stepping back from church would lead to an increase in their mental health, their emotional health, and their spiritual health. There's a lot of press out there these days about some of the environments of churches being oppressive, maybe even abusive, Uh, leadership functioning in a way that lacks integrity, in a way that is spiritually authoritarian, And certainly we know that it's a significant challenge that we deal with in our modern time. But also the data shows that church attendance is correlated with the following things. Regularly going to church 
is correlated with less depression, less suicide, less emotional pain medicators such as smoking and substance abuse. It's also correlated to greater social support, greater meaning in life, greater life satisfaction, more volunteering, greater civic engagement, and children more likely to grow up happy. The more one attends church, the less likely that person is to commit a major crime. Children raised in church-going in households are less likely to be depressed, use drugs, or engage in sexual activity outside of marriage. One study even suggests that church attendance can add up to seven years of your life. In a Washington Times article back just a couple of years ago, they surveyed numerous areas and uh, numerous people of, and categories and then rated their level of uh, emotional health over the past years. Those categories involve Republican, Democrat, low income, high income. There were a number of categories that were surveyed, and of every single category that was surveyed, the only segment of the population whose mental health actually improved during the pandemic was those who regularly attended church. Of all the categories surveyed in the culture, across a myriad of segments, the only category of people whose mental health actually increased during the pandemic were people who had committed themselves to regularly attending church. The reason I bring some of those things up is that, as we mentioned earlier, today is Mother's Day. And we're going to springboard from our text in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 6, and dive into some other things related to Mother's Day and families and male and female. It's a pretty significant and critical issue in our day. And the reason I bring up some of the statistics is simply this. Often when it comes to what Scripture teaches in terms of male and female, in terms of single or married, husbands and wives, children and families, what Scripture says can often feel quite antiquated to us, can feel somewhat obsolete, somewhat outdated, and a culture that has discovered things that are more sophisticated when it comes to human beings. And so as we look into Scripture, at a book that was written thousands of years old, sometimes it can feel repressive. It can feel constraining. It can feel narrow or limited. And yet, friends, what I would dare to say is this. The truth of Scripture is as relevant as ever. The truth of God's design for family, for male, for female, for singles, for marrieds is as relevant as it has ever been. It's astonishing to me, and maybe I shouldn't say astonishing, but it's, it's interesting to me that the only category of people whose mental health actually increased during the pandemic were those who gathered together as congregations to worship God. Now, what I'm not saying is this. What I'm not saying is that we follow after Jesus or that we believe in God as consumers because in somehow way that makes our lives better. The reason that we follow Jesus is not because if we follow Jesus, then we get benefits for ourselves. That's not what I'm saying. As we looked at the book of Revelation, we saw that followers of Jesus in John's day, many of them suffered. Many of them had job loss. Many of them had lack of income. We follow Jesus not because it benefits us. We follow Jesus not because there's a product to be delivered. We follow Jesus simply because we believe he he uh, was crucified and rose from the dead, and we believe that Scripture is true. That's why we follow Jesus. And yet in following Jesus, it makes sense 
that if God's truth is gloriously woven into our lives, that we will feel the blessings and the impact of following after God's created design in our lives. Does that make sense? So we don't follow Jesus because we get a product delivered. We don't follow Jesus because it makes our lives better. But the more that God's purposes are gloriously woven through actions and behaviors, the more that the creator's design is gloriously woven into our beings, it does make sense that we would experience benefits of what it means to follow after him. We follow Jesus and we gather together because Jesus himself is the way, the truth, and the life. We don't follow Jesus to have better lives. We don't follow Jesus because that what's, that's what works for us. We don't follow Jesus because it's kind of like a spiritual gym membership where we, where we are consumers of the benefits of being gym members. We gather together like this, not because it increases our mental health, although it does. We gather together like this because Jesus asked us to. But in doing that, we also receive the blessings of walking in the footsteps of the creator who designed us. And so when we look at males and females, we go to scripture and we say, how has the creator gloriously woven the ideas of his design in our being? As Liv said earlier, I realize that this topic in this room, whether you're here in this room or online, can be a painful topic. There are women here who are moms, but who have experienced a tremendous amount of pain through a loss. There are women who desire to be moms and never had that opportunity or fear they never will. There are women who long to be moms, but it's questionable if they'll ever be so. There are women who have children who are making the wrong decisions, and there are hearts of moms that are broken by the decisions of their kids. There are women here who are raising grandsons and granddaughters because they've needed to step in place in some kind of crisis that happened to a mom. There are women who are estranged from the father of their very own children. There are women here who enjoy the delights of motherhood, and yet even their lives are not perfect. Remember almost probably 30, maybe even 35 years ago, having a conversation with a gal who was a friend of mine, and she was um, wrestling with breast cancer. And she was wondering and whether or not that would impact her ability to have her have children, which she so longed to do. Probably, maybe this was now 20 years ago, maybe 15, I'm not sure. I remember her passing. And she was a woman created by God in God's image with the same longings that many women have. But because of the ravages of cancer treatment on her body, she would never be able to have children, and even eventually, even though she got married, the cancer took her life. There is still goodness in God's design. God's plan for marriage, God's plan for family, God's design of male and female, it's not repressive, it's not constricted. It's not restraining, but the glorious purposes of the creator are gloriously woven through all of God's design. Well, as I said, we're going to look at some other verses this morning, but I still want to look at Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. And so some of these verses are going to be on the screen. I'll probably make a comment between them, but I'm going to actually ask you to read these with me together. And we're going to read the same six verses that we read last week, and then we'll springboard off and into a couple of other comments related to what we've been mentioning already. So let's read Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1 together. Let's read this together. 
As a prisoner for the Lord then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. That's Paul's initial statements to the people in Ephesians chapter 4. He says, you have a calling from God. Live in a way that's worthy, that's consistent with that calling. As we do that, Paul is not simply saying, stick fast to the truth, pound it in people's brains. Instead, next he also talks about the demeanor in which we're to hold to God's truth. It's not just enough to have right belief, right doctrine. He talks about the tone of our lives as we talk about these things. Our tone is not to be mean, nasty, antagonistic, oppressive with one another. Instead, in verses 2 and 3, he talks about the tone. These verses will be up. Let's read these together. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. And so Paul says, yes, I want you to walk worthy of your calling of the Lord. I want my glorious truth to be woven in your lives. I want you to stand firmly in the truth that I've delivered to you. But also may your tone, may the demeanor, may the attitude of your lives be one of humility, gentleness, patience, kindness, one that brings unification rather than division and polarization. Well, next in verses 4 through 6, we'll read these verses together. And notice there's seven times that the word one shows up. Paul's challenge is we're not to live fragmented, disconnected lives. But there's a oneness, there's a unity to God's work in our lives. Let's read these verses together. There is one body and one spirit, just as you are called to one hope when you are called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Notice those last words of that verse. There's one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all, through all, and in all. Now, Paul is writing this directly to the people who are living in Ephesus. Remember last week I mentioned that Ephesus was a very prominent city in the ancient time. It was not sort of in the backwoods area of of the ancient Roman Empire. It was a progressive, intellectually rigorous, philosophically sophisticated city. And so Paul is writing these words to that kind of environment. He's confident that the truth of Scripture, the truth of God, can deal with the rigorous environment of the metropolis in Ephesus. And so he casts this vision That for those who follow Jesus, life is not segmented into various categories, but instead it's integrated, it's connected, it's unified. Friends, we live in a world where there's incredible fragmentation. There's fragmentation of what it means to understand what is male and female. There's fragmentation of relationship. There's fragmentation of families. There's fragmentation of our lives. But the truth of Scripture is there's a unifying influence to a belief in God. There's a unifying influence that comes from believing that God is creator. It's one of the reasons why there's helpfully increased mental health with those who are believers in God. Because life becomes less fragmented, becomes less compartmentalized, becomes less disconnected. And instead, there's a sense of unity, oneness of things existing together. And so for the next few minutes, we're just going to look at a few points as to how the truth of God being glorious wo- gloriously woven through male and female, family relationships, works in our lives. First, it's important to notice that there's a fixed point. 
There's a fixed point. The fixed point is God is the one who's the creator of male and female. We're not simply human blobs that kind of came from the primordial ooze. And that therefore we can craft or make our lives anything that we want. Instead, we are actually made in the pattern of a design. If you're male and female, you've been intentionally, deliberately designed by God. I fully recognize that sometimes there's confusion, there's dysphoria when it comes to that area. I'm not going to get into that so much today. That's another time. We'll def- I definitely want to deal with that at another time. But what I'm saying right now is our fixed point, our touchstone, and the storyline of Scripture, that it begins with the act of creation. It begins with a designer. It begins with a design. The purposes of the Creator are gloriously woven through your humanity as a woman. The purposes of the Creator are gloriously woven through you as a female. Whether you're married or not married, whether you have children or no children, the purposes of God are gloriously woven into the fabric of who you are. In Romans chapter 1, Paul deals with a number of issues that the people in Rome are wrestling with and a number of areas of confusion related to sexuality, marriage, male and female that they're wrestling with. Here's what he says in Romans chapter 1, verse 14. He says they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served created things rather than the Creator who is forever praised. In other words, Paul says one of the ways that we get off base is that our starting point is ourselves rather than the creator. We start with our own stories rather than starting our story with the fact that we're created by God. And once we worship and serve that which is created, namely ourselves, Rather than fixing our eyes on the creator who began everything, who begins the story, when we get that messed up, it brings confusion into all areas of life. I'm sure if you've had the experience, and maybe, I don't know, I think everybody's had this. Maybe you're at a a stoplight, and you're kind of like looking down, and all of a sudden, you catch movement, and you like jam on your brake hard because you think that you're drifting backward. That happens to all of us, right? You think that you're drifting backward when in fact the truck or bus or larger vehicle beside you is pulled away at the green light and you catch that movement at the peripheral of your vision and you think that you're moving backward and so you push on the brake because you want to keep yourself from drifting back when in fact the bus, the truck, the larger vehicle is actually moving forward. When you get your bearings is when you raise your eyes and look at fixed objects around you. Then suddenly you realize, oh, like I'm not moving. That bus, that truck is moving. You have to have a fixed object. You have to have a fixed starting point in order to get your bearings as to where you fit, where you belong, what's moving G.K. Chesterton wrote this, Christianity appeals to a solid truth outside of itself, to something which is, in that sense, external as well as eternal. It declares that things are really there, or in other words, that things are really things. In this, Christianity is at one with common sense. But all religious history shows that this common sense perishes except where there's Christianity to preserve it. Listen, friends, one of the strengths of Christianity is it actually says there are real things that exist. There are real males, there are real females. There's a real created order and design. There's real value to human life. Christianity says there are fixed points from which we understand who we are. We don't worship the created. We don't start with ourselves. But the fixed point is we have a creator God whose purposes are gloriously woven through humanity. And that's our fixed point. 
whether you're male or female, whether you're a mom or not a mom, one of the most important things that you can do to tend to the humanity that you've been created with is simply to worship God. According to Romans 1, I I get it that this doesn't sound relevant. I get that. One of the most, I don't even like to use that word, but one of the most relevant things that you can do to steward your own humanity is to be a worshiper of God. One of the most grounding things that you can do to cultivate your humanity is to worship God. When you worship God, your heart is directed toward God's greatness. When you worship God, your soul is refreshed in God's love. Your being is grounded in God's character. Your self-centeredness is dismantled by God's generosity. Your mind is shaped toward God's truth. Your hardness is softened by God's mercy. Your spirit is enlivened by God's glory. Your fear is swallowed by God's sovereignty. Your drives are steered by God's ambitions. Your autonomy is deconstructed by God's lordship. Your yearnings are guided toward God's goodness. Your pursuits are focused on God's purposes. Your desires are satisfied by God's kindness. Your restlessness is calmed by God's peace. Your inadequacy is eroded by God's grace. Your humanity is strengthened by God's infiniteness. What's the thing? Listen, friends. One of the best things that you can do as a human being is to be a worshiper of God. It's to allow God's infiniteness to be the starting point of your understanding your own humanity, your own story, your own strengths, your own weaknesses. The starting point for being the human being that God created you to be is worshiping a God who's infinite. Don't let that escape you. Whatever it takes, Tune in to God's infiniteness. Tune in to prayer. Tune in to reading scripture. Why? Because the best thing that you can do for your humanity is to be in touch with God's infiniteness. Psalm 139 applies that particularly to the human dynamic and who we are. Here's what David says in Psalm 139, verses 13 and 14. Notice all the ways that I underlined you here. These verses, there's a lot of interaction and interplay between David referencing himself as I and me in light of you, the Lord. He says, for you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. Isn't that beautiful, the interaction that David has? David doesn't, belief in God, worship of God does not diminish your humanity. David is essentially saying, I understand who I am. I understand my story. I understand where I fit in this world. I understand why I'm supposed to be here. I'm only able to understand that in light of who you have made me to be. Goes on in verses 16 and 15 and 16. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made by you in the secret place. When I was woven, there's our word, woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book 
before one of them came to be. Listen, friends, whatever your race, whatever your capacity, whatever your productivity level, whatever your performance level, it can be what it is, but what I want you to hear is this. You are woven together. As a human being, you're gloriously woven together in God's image. You're woven together as his creation. And women, I especially want you to hear that. God has given you the gift of womanhood. Whether you're single or married, whether you're a mom or not, God has created you and given you the gift of being a woman. Maybe just a couple of questions that you might want to ponder. Do you receive your life as a female, as a gift from the Lord? Do you live your life needing to prove yourself? Do you live your life needing to validate yourself? Are you always inadequate? Are you always deficient? Do you always not measure up? Are you always failing? Are you always lacking? Are you always damaged goods? Are you always not enough? Are you thankful for who you are? What would it look like as a female, as a woman, to simply say, Lord, I am enough in you. I may not be enough based on people's expectations of me. I may not be enough based on sort of the markers that our culture sets for being a woman. I may not be enough in terms of my body type. I may not be enough in terms of my personality. But Lord, I am enough in you. And listen, may your daughters know that. As men, we need to know that. You are enough in God. What if you were able to take the pressure off of yourself from working so hard to validate yourself and working so hard to accomplish a standard that you think you need to accomplish? What if you started at the starting point that you're gloriously woven and that you're gloriously designed by God? Just a couple other thoughts. Our design is that we're male and female. Again, I realize there's a huge conversation to be had here. We've spoken on this in the past. And I recognize that there is dysphoria. And again, we've talked about that in the past. We'll cover it again in the future. But for this morning, I mostly want to focus on the beauty of God's design. Genesis chapter 1 verse 27 says this. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female. He created them. As C.S. Lewis says this, he says, I believe in Christianity as I believe that the sun has risen, not only because I see it, but because by it I see everything else. I've always loved that quote. I believe in Jesus. I believe in Scripture as God's word. Not only because I can study and evaluate and I see the historical Jesus who was crucified and rose from the dead. I see the historical authenticity of the books that we have in our Bible. I can argue for all of that. And it's the reason, part of the reason why I believe in Scripture. But in addition to that, I also believe it because by it I see everything else. Scripture makes sense of the pain that we see in life. Scripture makes sense of the dysphoria, the confusion that we see in the area of sexuality and male and female. I believe in Christianity not only because I believe in this, but by this I can see everything else. And so we allow Scripture to illuminate male and female. We allow Scripture to illuminate every aspect of our lives. If you look back all the way into Genesis 1 and 2, what you find 
is this beautiful diversity as God creates. Listen to some of these contrasts. When God creates his world, there's light and there's darkness. It's a contrast. There's water and there's dry ground. There's living creatures on land and there are living creatures that fly in the air. There are living creatures in the seas and water and there are living creatures on dry land. There are lights in the sky for the day and lights in the sky for the night. There are wild animals and there are human beings. There's male and there's female. And so male and female is not accidental. The contrast is real. The differentness is real. And just like somehow God captures the beauty of who he is by dry land and water, he captures the beauty of of who he is by lights at night and the moon and the stars and light in the day by the sun. Just like he captures the beauty of who he is by creatures that swim in the sea and creatures that walk in the land, somehow God's beauty His diversity, the complexity, the glory, the richness of who he is, is reflected in male and female. And so to diminish them is actually to diminish the beauty of God, who is the great creator and person who exists in contrast. There's male, there's female, there's light, there's darkness. God is the incredibly beautiful and good creator. Abigail Dodds wrote an article, and I just want to read a paragraph from something that she wrote. Before, as she begins the article, she recounts being in the third grade and unknown to the rest of her classmates, boys and girls, she said she just had this inkling, this pressure, this drive to beat the boys in a race one day. And so she said she started out, and she kind of remembered all the coaching that her dad gave her, like breathe slowly, start slow, speed up as it goes on. And she actually won the race. But she said, that's kind of how I'm wired. I've always sort of been wired with this competitive spirit. And she says this, I want both single and married women to, be op- to open their eyes to the gift of having been made a woman. And part of that gift, even if you have never have children personally, is being a member of the sex that bears children, being given a body equipped for it. You are made to nurture life, physically and spiritually. You are made to transform almost nothing into something quite remarkable. You are made to take what is simple and boring and make it beautifully complex. There was an article in the Boston Globe from 2018, and I have a lot of details up here, just kind of maybe I'll share it some other time. It actually captured through some very sophisticated technology the the, the changes that happen in a woman's brain even when they become pregnant. Her brain, I'm not talking simply hormones, I'm talking like little, her, her gray matter changes to most likely empower her for sleep deprivation, the demands of nurturing children. There's literally physiological changes that happen there. The same changes actually somewhat happen in men, but they only happen through the involvement of men in caring for the children. So for women, they actually happen prior to birth. For men, they actually happen subsequent to birth, not as pronounced, but somewhat after birth as they, but it needs to be triggered by direct involvement of the male with the child. Listen, friends, the level of God's created design is absolutely amazing. Abigail Dodds continues, the first place to begin for any woman is with gratitude. Start by thanking your creator for making you a woman. Thank him for the breathtaking gift of life as a woman. Praise him for making you his precious daughter. All his works and ways 
are good. I'm going to ask our team to come out, and uh, we're going to conclude the service by singing the blessing. And I've grown to love this song. Uh, sometimes Sunday mornings I shoot back to my office pretty or somewhat early, and I usually drift in here around 8.15 or so. Our team is still rehearsing. And I got to tell you, like this morning, I sometimes, you know, the chairs are fine, but sometimes, you know, I get a little fidgety so when I'm speaking and stuff. And so I sometimes sit over here and meditate. Other times I just like walk around this place and straighten some chairs and it gives me something to do, you know. And, um, and man, like they started rehearsing the song and it gripped me emotionally. It did. Listen to me, friends. There is so much cursing in our world when it comes to humanity. Some of you have been cursed out as women. You've been cursed out. You've been demeaned. We live in a culture that's head high in cursing, in demeaning sticking people in their place. If you disagree with me, I curse you. If you say the wrong thing, I curse you. Not so in Scripture. Not so in Scripture. It's filled with blessing. And the song, just, the candidate was leading it, but just the first words, the Lord bless you. Like, where do you hear that in our culture? Anywhere? No. So let's stand, and we're going to sing the song. The words, the Lord bless you and keep you. By the way, that's three words in Hebrew. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. That's five words in Hebrew. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. That's seven words in Hebrew. And so this this scripture escalates. It's from the Numbers chapter 6, a, a pronouncement of blessing by the priest on the people of Israel. Like the, the, the blessing becomes heightened as we go through this. Like three, five, seven words. The blessing is heightened. It's accelerated. What an amazing thing, friends, if we just sing this and we, we bless one another. Like we say this to one another. Some of you have not heard words a blessing in your life for years. And we want to be a church that blesses human beings with the beauty and presence of God. So let's sing this together.
God, we pray your blessing on human beings and especially our mothers and our ladies, our females this morning. May your hand of blessing be upon them. May we be a church that blesses people. Amen. Just before you go, um, there's little carnations out in the foyer. There's little verse cards as well. We want every single female. Uh, if you've got a baby, we'd love to see babies with little carnations tucked in their hand. So if you're a female, no matter what age, married, single, old, young, mother, like a carnation is for you, feel free to pick up a verse card if you're a woman as well, if you'd like that. God bless and have a wonderful day.